Thank you for joining us. This is Michelle Savage from XBRL US, and you are here for the webinar, How Structured XBRL Data is Used Today. Um, just a few logistical points before we get started. Uh, we will take questions throughout the program, and to submit a question, you can just click on the Q&A link at the top of your screen on the little console and submit your question that, that way, and uh, we'll take them at various points during the program. Um, if you do have any technical issues uh, listening to or, or seeing the uh, slides, please send us an email at support, S-U-P-P-O-R-T, at xbrl.us, and we'll do our best to uh, get you back up and online. Uh, we are offering CPE credit for this uh, session today, and so at two points during the program, we will be asking uh, poll questions. If you are getting CPE credit, please make sure that you respond to those questions and uh, then we'll get your certificate a little bit later. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and uh, start our program. Let me just walk you through the agenda. <clears throat> um, first, we're gonna be covering data and technology, how information is consumed in the new age. This is a study that was conducted by the CFA Institute, and we're very pleased to have with us today Mohini Singh, who is ACA, Director at, of Financial Reporting Standards at the CFA Institute. Mohini, thanks very much for joining us. Um, after Mohini uh, gives her presentation, we're gonna take a couple of those CPE questions I mentioned. Then we'll talk about uh, XBRL data today and how you can use it. And I will be covering off on that. I'm Michelle Savage. And uh, then we'll cover some CPE questions and then talk a little bit about some upcoming events. So with that, I wanna thank everybody for joining and I'm going to switch my screen and bring up some slides prepared by the CFA Institute. And I'm now gonna turn it over to Mohini Singh. Mohini. Mohini, you wanna make sure that you're off, uh, off mute. Uh, Mohini, we cannot hear you right now. Uh, let me just ask my colleague, David Toriello. David, um, are you able to hear Mohini? I'm not, Michelle. Uh, it looks like she has hung up the phone. Hopefully she's dialing back in and will be rejoining us momentarily. Okay, great. Okay, well, we'll just wait a few minutes here. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm planning on covering in my portion. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about some of the data that is available today in XBRL format. And you may be surprised at the breadth of coverage um, that we have of XBRL data. Um, and then I'm going to be showing uh, a couple of tools that are available to you today to begin using XBRL data. Um, Michelle, I apologize. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Perfect. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So take it away, Mohini. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, we're going to no, switch over to, to Mohini and we have your slides up here. Can you see your slides okay? I can. So Great. can we go over to slide two, please? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I do hope you can still hear me. Uh, what I'm going to do today is talk to you about the latest CFA Institute publication, Data and Technology, How Information is Consumed in the New Age. Uh, what it addresses is which data are available today, how data are being consumed by investors and others, and goes on to refute the claim by some that the data is not being consumed. Before I get to that, though, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about CFA Institute. We are a global not-for-profit organization of investment industry professionals. We have over 160,000 members in 162 markets. What we are best known for is producing the Chartered Financial Analyst, or CFA curriculum, and administering the CFA exam. 
Once candidates pass our exams, we give them the CFA designation and they become members of our organization if they choose to do so. This slide that you're looking at um, shows you the occupational profile of our membership. And as you can see, 26% of our members are analysts. The reason I bring this up is that because when many parties are talking about the impact of uh, digitalization on corporate reporting, they think about the production of the information. We are also interested in the consumption of the information and how this information can be easier for our members uh, and our analysts to consume because we are the consumers of information. So let's start at the beginning. What data is actually available? And let's talk about regulatory filings. Regulators such as the US Securities and Exchange Commission currently have adopted, and as of 2020, the European Securities and Markets Authority will adopt rules requiring companies to provi provide financial statement in information in an interactive format, i.e. using XBRL. The SEC compiles this information in what they call the financial statement and notes data sets. These data sets provide the text and detailed numeric information from all financial statements as well as their notes. The SEC provides some useful tools as well, such as the financial statement query viewer, an intuitive, quick, and easy to use tool. Let me give you an example of what they can do with it. The viewer allows searches of all facts across all filings, which means users no longer have to search one filing at a time. So a user can aggregate, say, a specific disclosure across all filers for a target period. Analysts can also download these Excel files, uh, sorry, these files into their Excel spreadsheets for financial analysis. Now, a well, lot of users what yes. I'm sorry, should I should I flip the slide? I'm sorry, I wasn't quite sure where you needed to be. No, not yet. Okay, okay, just let me know. Thanks. Sorry. You're good, you're good. So to take advantage of, say, uh, artificial intelligence and other advanced analytic tools, you really need high quality digital machine readable data and metadata. This massive SEC database serves up 1.5 billion copies of documents filed by companies each year. And currently, interestingly, 85% of the downloads each day are made by bots, not humans. And this is because an increasing number of market participants want to use advanced technology like AI to help them make financial decisions. And these bot downloads are indicative of that threat, of, of that trend. You can change the slide now. Next slide, please. So our 2016 publication, Data and Technology, Transforming the Financial Information Landscape, looks at how investors can benefit from the use of XBRL. Next slide, please, Michelle. So on this, uh, on this uh, uh, slide, you can see what the report lists as five main benefits for investors. Improved financial statement accuracy, productivity, opportunity for higher returns, better risk management. And in the report, uh, if you're interested in going to it, we actually provide examples of each uh, to demonstrate the point. Due to these benefits, many data providers now use XBRL as part of their data gathering. It allows them to pro provide their customers with faster and more detailed information. Morningstar actually provides a great example of how XBRL increases productivity. According to Morningstar, it takes five days to process HTML filings and display the information for their clients, whereas aggregating XBRL data is nearly instantaneous. With the availability of XBRL and technology to sift through data, investors are now in a better position to perform faster, better analysis. Investors can research more companies or they can take a deeper dive into companies they already know. Also, believe many, also many believe XBRL could bring better opportunities to small and medium-sized entities by making it easier for investors to actually cover these companies. So we believe structured data could, A, help investors by allowing them to make more informed investment decisions, and B, bring greater investment 
to companies that were previously not so closely followed. And what does all this do? It leads to a more efficient and transparent capital market. But of course, there are improvements that can be made. Structuring needs to be expanded beyond the financial statements to earning, earning releases and supplemental reporting packages that often move markets. Also, there is invaluable information for investors in the MDNA, which currently isn't required to be structured by regulators. So that, that's what we talked We talked about the regulators and we talked about benefits to investors. But what about data providers? Data providers today are building increasingly advanced consumption tools. They've actually explained to us how they pull the XBRL data from filing, normalize and clean them for any errors, and present it to users in a ma manner that allows easy access and immediate analysis, as well as the ability to export it into an Excel spreadsheet. Providers build upon the X, uh, XBRL technology to further tag and improve the readability and usability of financial documents. For example, by tagging non-GAAP information, items such as product warranty accruals, the MDNA, earnings releases, comment letters from regulators, ESG data. And this information overlays the XBRL data from the regulator. Data providers build these tools to actually meet user demands for greater tagging of information. Tagging the earnings release, for example, allows users to export data from the earnings release directly into an Excel-based financial model. Users can then perform side-by-side -side comparisons of preliminary income statements against previously reported numbers without having to manually input the data. This simplifies the process for analysts and reduces errors, as well as the time spent pulling information manually from multiple companies. Analysts, for example, can also more easily compare EBITDA and non-GAAP EBITDA, review the MDNA of a given company, say Facebook, to identify the number of active users, apply machine learning to block tag data to identify, say, early adopters of the new revenue recognition model. So let me show you an example. Michelle, the next slide, please. Here we see how the CalcBench platform allows users to systematically access accounting policies and get information with a few mouse clicks. Here an analyst searches among accounting policies to learn which firms have referred to the full retrospective method of recognizing revenues. Next slide. Now suppose this analyst wants to know how the numbers have been affected by a change in the revenue recognition policy among any one issuer. Consider Microsoft's income statement from the first quarter of calendar year 2018, fiscal Q3 for Microsoft, and compare it with the originally filed statement from the first quarter of calendar year 2017. Note in the screenshot, and it's the top two numbers on the right hand side. The product revenue is 13.391 billion for the 2017 period, and the service revenue is 8.699 billion. Microsoft originally filed these numbers in April of 2017. Next slide, Michelle. Now look at the revised numbers under the newly adopted revenue recognition rules. Notice that Microsoft's product revenue from one year ago is now 14.513 billion, a difference of 1.122 billion. The impact to diluted EPS was roughly nine cents a share. This case study shows the power that derives from 
structured data. Users save time, money, and increase the power of the inferences they can make, which is the value information is designed to deliver. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's take a look at another example, one of disclosures. This is the Idacity platform, a different data provider. On, on this platform, investors can use the, the disclosure research checklist to identify where a company may disclose certain topic areas. For example, using the disclosure research checklist, see Pfizer's 2017 Q3 filings and look at the notes, at the list of notes to the financials. That's on your left-hand left side of the screenshot. Now note the absence of a debt footnote. Next slide, please, Michelle. Instead, to identify what Pfizer disclosed about its debt, conduct a search for elements that refer to the debt codification. This revealed that Pfizer does tag facts in the filing using elements that refer to the FASB codification reference for topic 470, debt. The search brings up all elements that refer to debt. Clicking on an element jumps directly to its location within the filing. Interestingly, Pfizer disclosed this debt information within footnote seven, financial instruments. Next slide, please, Michelle. But it isn't just investors who use the data. The European Banking Authority now produces a remarkable range of aggregate data pulled from its holdings of EU-wide bank filings. For analysts within the banking regulator, the level of detail is exceptional, exceptional allowing them to select an area of interest and drill down within geographies, lines of business, areas of risk, and institutional grouping, and then to refine these results for individual institutions. If an analyst, say, is interested in non-performing loans in Southern Europe, this information is just a few clicks away. <clears throat> this screenshot of the EDA's website provides an overview of the types of information that is available. <clears throat> Another example, and I got this from the XBRL International Newsletter, is of the DBA, the Danish Business Authority. The DBA collects XBRL financial statements from the approximately 240,000 private companies that operate in Denmark. It is exploring cutting edge ways to apply machine learning techniques to predict possible corporate failures. The goal is to provide early warning information to entrepreneurs that their companies are exhibiting symptoms that could lead to restructuring, closure, or bankruptcy. What the DBA does is it takes historical data about failed institutions through time, and then lets machine learning algorithms create patterns that can be matched against every other company's data to locate similarities. The DBA is using hard financial measures, such as solvency ratios, as well as softer data points, such as changes in the lag between the end of the reporting period and the filing date. So, so far we've shown you various examples of how the data has been used. Now let's address this statement that we hear from some parties that the data isn't being used. Despite the availability of data, and the advanced consumption tools being built to access the data, some in the preparer community continue to assert that the data are not being used. Let's consider a few studies. 
The Center for Excellence in Accounting and Security Analysis at Columbia Business School conducted a detailed study on how investors, analysts, and other data seekers in the market are using XBRL tagged financial data. Of preparer perspectives, the report states, and I'm quoting here, most filers we surveyed doubt whether any invest investors are using their XBRL <clears throat> data and believe they are bearing an unnecessary incremental cost with any benefits going to data aggregators who resell the data and can reduce their own data collection costs. In addition to this, <clears throat> preparers also told uh, the study that was being conducted, that they want to limit the quantity of data being tagged and filed because of their concerns that no one demands certain data at present. Conversely, the summary of the investor analyst survey and interview findings states, the core finding is that there is clear demand for timely structured machine readable data including information in financial reports, and that this need can be met by XBRL as long as the XBRL tag data can reduce the total processing costs of acquiring and proofing the data. With respect to SEC filings, users view access to the full array of footnote, MDNA, and earnings release numerical data as the main reason to consider adapting their workflow to incorporate XBRL tagged filings. In conclusion, the report finds that investors and analysts, one, want and use interactive data that captures the information in the footnote, MDNA, and earnings release. Two, are interested in the structured tag tagging of the detailed items in financial statements in contrast to the claims of, of preparers. Three, do not require a standard or limited number of data items. Four, extensively use non-financial data outside the financial reports. Five, utilize data they deem to be useful even if the data are not directly comparable across firms. And finally, six, are looking for easy to use XBRL consumption and analysis tools that do not require programming or query language knowledge. So you can see that what investors and preparers say is pretty much diametrically opposed to one another. Now we've addressed whether or not invest, investors are using the data. There is just one other misconce misconception that I'd like to clarify before I wrap up. I'd like to address the fact that some believe that with the advent of new technologies such as blockchain and AI, that XBRL has somehow become redundant or outdated. That's simply not the case. In fact, all of these technologies need to work together. For example, you can use AI to tag up to say 80% of your financial statements with manual intervention required for only the other 20%. And the other technology that I was talking about for blockchains to actually operate efficiently, they need to use a standardized language and that will be XBRL. So I re reiterate, all of these technologies need to work together. Thank you very much for your time today. And if you'd like to access our reports, the links are within the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you, Michelle. Well, Hini, thank you very much. That was a, a great presentation and really um, illuminated a lot of issues related to XBRL. Um, <clears throat> we have a couple of questions and I wanted to just see if you could, if you could answer some of these questions. <clears throat> the first one, are there any earnings releases being tagged currently in the United States or globally? 
I know that the data providers are doing it. We have certainly uh, been pushing for the uh, SEC to require it. Mm -hmm. In other areas of the world, I'm afraid I don't know, but I can certainly find that out. Right. But I know that there has been a demand from investors, and so many of the data providers are going ahead and tagging it. Okay, great. And another question. Um, If I already have a subscription to Bloomberg, what is the main advantage of using XBRL data? And I could probably weigh in on that one too, Mohini, if you'd rather. You can, but but I, here's here's what I think a lot of people don't realize is that you know Bloomberg is using XBRL data already. And in fact, when mm-hmm. we when we uh, 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 surveyed our members, a lot of them who do use these data providers say that they don't know much about XBRL, and that's because they're using the XBRL data without realizing that they're using it. Exactly. That was that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> so, yes, many of the, yeah, many of the data providers that um, investment professionals are using today are already incorporating XBRL data into their their databases. Okay. Um, the next question is uh, is someone who's looking for more examples of integration between blockchain and XBRL. I don't know, Mahini, if you want to take that one, or or I have a a, a few thoughts on that as well. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, when we think of blockchain, one of the areas that, that we have looked at um, in blockchain is smart contracts. Smart contracts, which are, which are essentially uh, digital contracts that are triggered by various events, like a, you know, a covenant may be um, enacted, you know, there, there may be a trigger of a covenant or some piece of data is available. We feel that smart contracts need to be driven by standardized data um, and that's where we see the intersection between um, the XBRL standard and uh, data that is very consistent, that is uniform, that is consistently applied, and, and blockchain is really in, in the smart contract world. Um, we have a few other questions here. Um, Can I just add to that, Michelle? Sure. Yes. Uh, you know, until, until blockchains are standardized, you know, investors aren't going to try and figure out how each block, blockchain works. So that standardization is going to be very important for our constituents. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. Um, the next question, um, will there be any chance that the SEC or different uh, boards or organizations globally may adapt to file more of their forms using XBRL? Mahini, any thoughts on that one? We don't know, but we do know that that's exactly what we're advocating for. It may take some time, but that's exactly because what we are what, what we want is you know, standardization for as much as possible, both, you know, in terms of how many uh, reports that you file with, with uh, any regulator that you're, you're dealing with. So right now we're just talking about, you know, the financial statements, but what about uh, other reports? What about tax reporting? We, mm-hmm. we would like standardization across all those reports. Right. And I will say that, that uh, the SEC has come out with some uh, rule proposals recently, one uh, most specifically on variable annuities and life insurance products, where they are uh, proposing that data reported uh, for these companies be put in standardized XBRL format. And uh, the idea is that these are very complex uh, securities or, or products rather, and um, putting them in standardized format will make them much easier to work with. Um, another rule proposal that came out recently from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is a you know different uh, regulatory body, is um, they're proposing the use of XBRL for utilities and others reporting using the, the forms that they um, that they require. Um, so those those are just the U.S. initiatives. And as uh, as Mohi mentioned, there's a lot happening in Europe right now, and um, that's going to hit in uh, 2020. Um, let me just go quickly through these other questions, and then then I'll get to the the next um, section here. Um, Let's see. Due to the large number of tags available, does the CFA or any organization work on the standardization issue so that users can compare results at companies? Uh, no, uh, we, we have a we have a small department, a small advocacy division, and so we work more on the policy level and not not on the on the detailed technical level. Right. I will say that Expert International and has has uh, established a group that is focusing on how to um, uh, 
basically set guidelines on how extensions are used, requiring that they that if an extension is created by a company, that it, it roll up to um, a larger base taxonomy element, so that um, so that the data at that base base taxonomy element level can be compared more consistently from company to company, because that is a challenge. And that is something that, that um, you know, we, and, and the data quality committee, and Mohini actually is part of the data quality committee that Expert US has, has established. Um, they are working on guidance on, um, you know, for filers on how to prepare more consistent uh, content and uh, reduce the, the number of extensions that are used. Um, and let me just take, I'll just do one more question here and um, I'll take this one before we move on to the next section. Um, could you please comment on the orange button taxonomy and the solar industry expert data? How is that data used? Um, orange button is a taxonomy that, that was developed in partnership between um, industry, the solar financing industry and the Department of Energy. And um, the, the focus of that initiative was to develop standards for solar financing. So there's a, a relatively large taxonomy that's been created and um, that touches all aspects of the solar financing life cycle from the creation of a solar plant um, on through the, um, the, the operation of the, of the solar plant. And um, the uh, SunSpec Alliance, which is you know, one of the industry groups that's really spearheading this whole initiative, but working with x -Rail US, is um, has a working group that is working on different applications for orange button data and, and on refining that taxonomy. So there is a lot of work going on in that area in um, using the data and refining the taxonomy itself. Um, so with that, let me, let me just, uh, I'm just gonna go on and actually pull up some polls Feel free to continue asking questions, you know, submitting questions, and we'll get to them as we get towards the end of this. But I want to make sure we get to the rest of the program. Um, so first, for those of you, again, who are getting CPE credit, I'm going to post a, the, our for, first poll question here. Um, and the question is, most CFA Institute members fall into two functional categories. What are the two categories? Are they analysts and portfolio managers? Answer number one. Accountants and risk managers? Answer number two or CEOs and consultants? That's answer number three. So if you just uh, click on the, the button that uh, you think most properly represents the answer to that question, and we'll give it another 30 seconds here, and then we'll go on to the next question. Okay, I'm going to end that poll and we'll go on to poll number two. Which of the following is not a benefit of XBRL? Um, improves productivity, answer number one. Results in more information being disclosed, answer number two. Or empowers the analyst, answer number three. So which one is not a benefit of XBRL? And again, we'll give you 60 seconds to respond to this question. Uh, we do have more questions coming in, but I think, um, and, and so Mohini will have more questions for you towards the end, but I think we'll go ahead and, and jump into the next um, next section here once this poll is, is completed. Okay, just like another 10 seconds for the poll. Okay, I'm gonna, gonna close this down now. Thank you very much for your responses. Um, and now we're going to actually switch to another set of slides. Okay, and so, um, and Mohini will be sticking around for the next few minutes. So let me just uh, go through this quickly and then we'll get to more questions. Um, so what, what I planned on covering is to talk a little bit about um, the type of XRL data that's available around the world, just to uh, 
you know, hopefully get you more interested in, in checking out some of this information. Um, and this chart looks at the types of um, implementations that have been established around the world. Um, and they fall into a couple of different categories. Uh, financial regulators, which include uh, banking type implementations, such as the FDIC, is the most prominent uh, type of uh, expert implementation. There are 59 of these around the world. And the second most common category are capital markets programs, which are typically you know, public companies like the SEC program. Um, and this program, as uh, Mohini had mentioned, is um, set to expand pretty dramatically starting next year. Uh, the European Securities Markets Authority is going to require every European Union country, um, in addition to the UK, will be required to file using inline XBRL. So that bar is going to increase from uh, what is today 25 up to 53. So there will be a lot more programs and, and hence a lot more data available. Uh, business registrars, which are typically private companies, um, there are uh, 15 of these around the world. Tax regulators follows with nine. And then there are other uh, miscellaneous categories at uh, 13. Um, and if we take a look at the regions where these programs exist, um, the most common area is in Europe. There are 67 programs today. And again, that does not include the uh, ESMA program that's going to kick in next year. Um, there are 37 in uh, the general area, which we call here Asia and Oceania, uh, 12 in the Americas, and three in Africa. And um, so we, we do see, you know, quite a few programs around the world and, and pretty broad distribution. And the programs can be split into public company reporting, um, which you see the, the countries here, South Korea, Mexico, Peru, Colombia, Chile, Israel, China, Japan, Taiwan, Canada, uh, the UAE, and Singapore. Uh, private company reporting in the UK, India, Denmark, South Korea, Italy, Belgium, and Germany. And uh, we also have uh, bank uh, implementations in Peru, Panama, Chile, Belgium, France, Spain, and the United States, and government reporting in the Netherlands and Australia. So a uh, pretty broad coverage of different types of programs. So why standardize and, and why XBRL? Um, when I think about standardization, I think about three things. Standardization of data is, is really about communicating. It's about you know, helping people and entities and organizations communicate in the same language to all stakeholders. So it's establishing a single understandable language that is um, represented the same way for the creator of the data, the intermediaries of the data, like the database and analytic providers, and then also the end users of the data, which is you know, investors, analysts, regulators, the public, the media. So it's really communicating, speaking the same language. The second key reason to, to standardize is automation. Um, our, our goal with standardization is to make data machine readable. So we eliminate the need to rekey the data and to, to vet the data. Um, because that can be time consuming and lead to errors. So automation is, is number two. And third, improve. And improving the data through standardization is because standardization can eliminate ambiguities. It can improve data quality. And so why XBRL? Um, first and foremost, I, I always mention is that XBRL is a free open standard. There are no licensing fees associated with the use of the XBRL standard. Um, it is non proprietary. Uh, there are some standards that um, have become standards over time, things like Excel or even Google Sheets, which are proprietary. But XBRL is maintained and supported by an international nonprofit standards organization. And that organization, XBRL International, actively supports, maintains, and evolves that standard. And, and that's really important. So we're not tied to a particular commercial entity that may go out of business, may have its own special interests to, uh, to deal with. It's a non-proprietary standard. It's widely used, as we showed in the last couple of slides. Um, it's the only standard available for financial data, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And, and secondly, it keeps pace with changes in technology. Uh, so, and, and we're going to cover that as well. Oh, one thing I missed here is it easily incorporates changes in reporting requirements. And I think this is a really critical attribute of the XPRL standard, um, because today, 
6,000 public companies in the United States easily transition to a new version of the U.S. GAAP taxonomy every year. For the FDIC, which um, uh, has jurisdiction over banking institutions, new releases are published on an even more frequent basis. But the transition for these types of organizations is seamless. It doesn't interrupt uh, the, the time series data. It doesn't um, have a negative impact on software companies, on data consumers. So having a standard that easily incorporates changes that happen over the course of years or decades is really, really critical and a standard. And, and x is designed to do those. So I think it's important to talk about the characteristics of financial data. When we look at a value, like the value that you see in the, the box in the center, 902138, um, that value by itself it is meaningless. But when we look at the rows and the columns on this balance sheet, we know exactly what it represents. Um, we know that it is for the company Solar City, which isn't shown in the, shown here, but is but we know that that's the entity. So that's the ident the identifier for the, the um, value is Solar City. We know that it represents current assets, which is the the label. We know that it's in U.S. dollars, it's in thousands, and it's for the time period 2015. So all of those characteristics, everything we see in those bubbles, needs to be represented somehow in that data point when it gets to the computer in order for it to be machine readable and understood. So what we, we think of a, a financial data standard as having various layers. The first layer is information, the metadata. And that's really all those bubbles that I just showed you. Things like the definition, the currency, the balance type, the scale, labels, uh, time period. Is it an instant? Is it a duration? Those are all attributes that we need to understand about a value in order for it to be understood um, and easily consumed by a machine. So that's layer number one. Layer number two is the identifiers. And there could be entity identifiers, things like the LEI, the legal entity identifier, it could be CIKs, um, as in the case of the SEC program, could, could even be a QCIP, which is also a, a standard, QCIP is standard, but it is a proprietary standard because it's owned um, by uh, Standard Poor's. Um, it could also have classification identifiers like SIC codes or NAICS. And the third layer is the format. And the format is really what helps communicate that information. So it could be XML, it could be HTML, JSON, CSV. XBRL is designed so that it has all of these layers. It has the information layer, the identifier layer, and the format layer. And the different formats, it, it's interesting because when XBRL was first developed back in 1998, it was developed as an XML standard because XML has unique properties that allow you to tag or, or embed information in a, in a value. In 2011, we added another format, HTML, with inline XBRL, which is a combination of an HTML and an XBRL document. And in 2018, um, XBRL International came out with two additional standards for JSON and CSV. So there is XBRL in XML, XBRL in HTML, XBRL in JSON, and XBRL in CSV. And it's important because these different types of formats allow it to be used in lots of different ways. And we go back to those three key points about what a standard is designed to do, it communicates. It communicates the information layer and the identifier label, layer rather, and it automates by using a machine readable format like XML or HTML or JSON or CSV. So to access XBRL data, as you know, someone had asked the question earlier about, about Bloomberg, that was a really good question because many data providers today, including Bloomberg and uh, Refinitiv, formerly Thomson Reuters, and Morningstar and um, Standard Poor's, they all access XBRL data and they incorporate it into their products. But we wanted to make it even easier and provide another mechanism to access this data. And that's through a database that we've been, um, that we developed back when the SEC program first went into place. And in that database, we've been collecting US GAAP and IFRS data and all of that data is, is currently available. And we'll soon be adding additional uh, 
types of data from Mexico, from Japan, from Taiwan, and, and so forth. You know, going forward, we'll continue adding um, XBRL formatted data into that database. And our goal with this data database was really to test out analytical tools to check the quality of the XBRL data and to demonstrate how XBRL data can be used. And so after we created this database, we then created a standard for an XBRL API. And the goal there was to improve the ease of use in working with XBRL formatted data that's produced by any taxonomy that conforms to the global XBRL specification. So the XBRL API standard is something that um, is available today. Um, you can access it on our web website and I'm gonna show you exactly how it works. We also created a data community, which is really a forum for developers to get questions answered about using the XBRL API and XBRL data. Our goal with the community is to create more open source tools for users and to encourage the embedding of the XBRL API into open source or commercial applications. So we encourage everybody to, to take a look at it and use, that, use it. Um, <clears throat> the API is available a couple different ways. Um, one, you can use it through a client server like Insomnia, and that's what you see the, the black box there is Insomnia. Um, you can also use it through a, one of our Google Sheet samples that we've created. And I'm gonna show you one of those. Um, we also make our data available through um, an online uh, desktop solution that we've created called uh, Company Filing, no, actually it's not desktop, it's a web version, web product called Company Filing Analysis. And, um, you know, we make our data available to the general public and to XBRL members kind of at different levels. To the general public, they can have an access to a kind of a taste of the data. For um, members, members have greater access to the data. They can, they can access more information. And, um, and you can find that information on our website and I can, I can email it to you if you're, if you're interested in that. But so first I'm gonna show you a, a demonstration of how this API works. And we'll specifically look at um, one of the uh, Google Sheets. Okay, this is, this is a Google Sheet that I created. And just so you know, I am not a technical person. Um, APIs are relatively new to me and I'm just learning how to work with them. And I was able to, to pull in research and development data, um, R&D expenditures for an SIC code uh, for, for specific years, and then create this, this uh, report. So, this looks at R&D expenditures for 2017 through 2016. It gives us a percent change and it's pulling the data in for the pharmaceutical preparation uh, SIC code 2834. And this is what you see over here. This is just a list of all of the SIC codes and the corresponding descriptions of the, the industry group that it represents. So I created this and you can actually, any of these green boxes, you can actually change that and revise the information reported there. So I'm gonna change this to 2800. And that is the SIC for chemical and allied products. And you can see that we're working away here. It's pulling in um, this new set of data. And the way this works is it works off of a single API call. And so what you have here is this is, if you look down on the, the bottom of this spreadsheet, this is called RD compare. So this is kind of my report tab or sheet. If I go into RG worksheet, this is a worksheet I created that, that's just pulling in raw data. It's just pulling the raw data in there and then it's pulled into the RG compare in a, in a much prettier format. And so if we want to take a look at the, um, the API call, it basically looks like this. It's pulling in, you know, it's pulling in all of this raw data. It's pulling in both 2017 and 2016 and uh, just kind of sticking it into the spreadsheet. This is the, the API call that it's pulling. I'm gonna show you that in more detail in a little bit. And, um, and then it just populates it into RD Compare. I can also change the time period. So let's say I want to look at 2016 and compare it to 2015. I can do that here. So this API call is pulling in data from the XBRL US database but these APIs could be used on any XBRL data. They could be used on data from Taiwan or Mexico or Japan, the US can be used on IFRS data, 
US data uh, or US GAAP data. And the way this is set up, this is a spreadsheet that you can actually pull in today. You could, you could go online this afternoon and pull in this individual uh, XPRL API sheet. You create your own copy. This is my copy of it. And then it'll allow me to pull in a number of set um, queries. So I can pull in single filing fact information. I can, I can look at all of the inline XPRL filings. So that's what I'm going to pull in here. So we've set up a bunch of these. So this is all the companies that have re been reporting in inline XPRL, uh, you know, as that mandate is, is you know, coming up soon. So this is something that you can use today. And as I said, for general members of the public, there's a subset of information that's available that you can use, subset of data you can collect. If you are an individual XPRL US member, you can pull in another, like, uh, like more data. And if you're a corporate member or what we call a power user member, you can pull in even more data. So I encourage you to go take a look at our website and go to the XPRL API and you can pull in more information there. So with that, I'm gonna go back to our slides. And here I just wanna show you this, this API call. So <clears throat> this is the API that was used to get the R&D data that you just saw. So what you see under the, the red underline here, this says the SIC code is 2831. That's for pharmaceutical preparations. This next uh, blue underline section here is telling it which elements I wanna pull. I wanna get R&D expense, which some companies use. R&D expense excluding acquired in process cost is another element that some, some companies use. And some companies also use another element called research and development expense software, excluding acquired and process cost. So you have to know a little bit about the US GAAP taxonomy to work with this, but it's relatively straightforward. This, is, this says that there are no dimensions to the data. It tells us that the, what the fiscal period is going to be. Here it says it's 2017, 2016. Um, although I've actually set that as uh, you know, something that you can revise. It says it's the, the latest fact, it's the ultimate fact. And then it tells us what, what information to return. Okay, to tell us what the entity CIK is, the name, the value reported, um, the, the time period, so that I can check all of that information when I pull it into the, the worksheet and then transport it into the report itself. So this looks like it may be complicated, but it's really not. And that's because we have a document online, a basically a, a guide to working with the API. And this just gives you a sense for the table of contents and explains all about facts, reports, entities, concepts, you know, all of the different information that you need to know in order to work with this API very successfully. So with that, we're gonna go on and uh, cover some CPE questions. And I think we got another, uh, a bunch of additional questions. So um, we'll get to those as soon as we go through these CPE questions. Okay, so the next CPE question is, XPRL data must be reported by which types of companies in the US today? Is it by public companies, by life insurance companies, or by banks? So give us the most appropriate answer here. And we'll give this another 30 seconds or so. Okay, just another five seconds and I'm gonna close down the poll. All right, we'll go to our last poll. XPRL documents can be created based on the following formats, HTML and XML, HTML, X, XML, and JSON, or HTML, XML, JSON, and CSV. So click on the appropriate response. And we got about another 30 seconds here.
And then I'm going to go on to questions. Okay, I'm going to close the poll down now. Thanks everyone for responding. Okay, let's go to some questions before um, I wrap up with some upcoming events. Um, the question came in is, Xperial data quality remains poor and inconsistent. Why? Mohini, do you feel comfortable taking that question? Sure. Um, well, I think this is a two-part answer. I think Part of the problem is that uh, the care standard amongst the preparers is low. So they think of uh, having to tag this data as simply a cost burden and a compliance exercise. And so they don't really, they're not taking much interest in how, how well the tagging is taking place. And the, and the second part of it is that there is a lack of enforcement from regulators. So if we could uh, get companies to understand that they can actually use their this standardized data for their own analysis, for their for their internal benefits, and they could get the regulators to uh, enforce uh, uh, more vigorously, I think we would see the quality of the data improve. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm just looking through the questions here. Uh, questions about how do I get the API? Um, it is on our website, and I'll email that link to everyone in, uh, in a follow-up tomorrow. And okay, the next question, why do the major data aggregators continue to use their own proprietary taxonomies when XPRL is free and data already supposedly standardized? Mohini, do you wanna take that question? Or I, I have some thoughts on that too. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, basically, XPRL data is, um, it, it is raw data. It is you know, coming in directly from the companies and um, the US GAAP taxonomy has uh, Basically, it has the flexibility allowed by US GAAP reporting, which is that you know some companies are allowed to you know some companies are allowed to create extensions to create their own custom elements. Um, there are multiple elements within the US GAAP taxonomy that represent a single type of value. Just like in the example that I showed, there are three different elements that represent R and D. And so, in order to um, make sure that you capture all of that, capture you know R and D expenditures for all companies that you're reporting on you need to make sure that you have those three elements. So many of the data providers have their own proprietary ways of kind of customizing and grouping that content. So um, that's really why it has to be, there has to be an additional level of normalization on top of the XPRIL data that is available. You're starting off with data that is much more normalized um, in XPRIL format than it used to be in when it was reported just in HTML, but there's still an additional level of normalization that, that's required simply because of the complexity of the US GAAP taxonomy and, and US GAAP reporting in general. Um, I don't know, Mohini, if there's anything you wanted to add to that. No, but there is another question I'd really like to address because I think it's an important one. May I take it? Please. Okay, so it's, uh, the question is, how can XPRL data be considered standardized and comparable when filers can create custom uh, line items, that's the mm -hmm. extension? Um, and I think the, the problem here, especially in the US, is because like I was saying, the care factor amongst companies is low. So uh, often we find that, you know, instead of looking for the appropriate tag, uh, they companies often create an extension where there isn't the need for one. That is clearly a problem and we need to uh, reduce that, that activity from going on. We certainly need to limit the number of extensions. However, while we care about standardized information, we also want to know about information that is very specific to the company. And that is, they have to be allowed to express that information because that, for investors, that, that those are the golden nuggets you're looking for in your valuation. So we want uh, standardized information, but we also want that specific, unique information for, in, within companies. And therefore, they must be allowed to use extensions, but only in rare circumstances. Right. And just to, to add to that, Mohini, I would say that you know, for someone who is pulling data from, um, you know, specific company, like say they're, they're analyzing, you know, they have a universe of 10 companies that they cover, <clears throat> those 10 companies, you know, will have extensions, but they're gonna be using the same extensions over and over and over. So whenever that data is pulled as a time series, 
the the user of that data, the investor, the analyst knows that they're getting consistent data because they're pulling the same element, extension or no, it's just, it is the same element. And they know that every period that they're pulling it, they're getting a, t- a time series of time series of consistent comparable information. So they, they can yeah. look at it like trends and year to year comparisons for a single company. Okay, um, another question came in about what about funds data in x format? Um, and that is something that we're considering. We do not have that information as yet. Let's see, and there was another question about um, you know, is the main advantage to directly use the same expert data is to, to cut the provider subscription, thus saving money? Um, I would say data providers do provide a lot of value add in their, their analytical offerings. And, and I mean, to me, the point of expert data is, is to eliminate the need to rekey and um, you know, eliminate the, the manual data entry that many of these providers do today, um, you know, databasing the content and to give them the opportunity to focus more of their energy on um, better analytics. And I think that's, that's more of what we'll, we'll see going forward. Um, so I don't know that, that this doesn't disintermediate um, those data providers. I, I think it just allows them to reduce their costs of um, just databasing content, which is really not a particularly useful um, use of time, frankly. Let's see. And does the XREL API capture and report the footnote tags filed with the SEC? And I believe, I don't know, David, if you're available and if you could respond to that. I don't think right now um, that we're pulling in the footnote tags. Uh, well, actually, the uh, footnotes are searchable in the API, and we're going to talk. Uh, to our members about that tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Yes, we have a call tomorrow for anyone who is an XPL US member, um, specifically speaking to the API and some new um, new features that we're adding. Uh, let's see. Okay. It was another question. It was mentioned that even though many different tags already exist, data can still be compared as tags can be grouped. Could you shortly elaborate on this? How are they grouped and what is the name of these groups? Um, I think that was me mentioning that, like for example, there, there may be three different uh, US GAAP elements that represent R&D expenditures. And those, you know, those need to be combined essentially so that if you're looking at three companies, each of which uses one of those individual tags, you're able to compare those companies. Um, there, there really are not those groups available. Um, there isn't like a, a set, you know, list of those groups, but that's a lot of what the database providers do is they establish those, those kind of hierarchy structures and groupings of different types of concepts. Uh, let's see. I'm just looking, glancing through these questions. I know that we're really running out of time, but we have gotten a lot of questions. Um, And just to respond to someone who asked about um, the structuring of earnings releases around the world, I was looking it up. Uh, the Bombay Stock Exchange actually requires that uh, that earnings releases be structured in XBRL. Okay, that's great. That's good to know. Okay, well, I think that's that is um, all the time that we have, and we will be, um, you know, we will look through these questions to see if there's anything here that we missed and make sure that we respond back to those individuals. Um, But tomorrow we should be sending a a link to the replay of the event. Um, We can also post the slides if that's something of interest. And and, and we'll also send a link to um, access the API as well because we encourage everybody to get on and try it. It's, um, you know, as we were saying, the data providers offer a very valuable service in that they're, you know, they are normalizing data to to a further extent. Um, But for those of you who want to, you know, test out the XPRL and use it on your own and just pull in some small subset, this is a great, easy way to do it and, and very inexpensively. Um, so I wanna thank Mohini uh, and the CFA Institute very much for speaking with us today. I think uh, you gave a, a great presentation. It gave people a good sense of the types of tools that are out there and the types of um, data that's out there and how it's being used. And um, 
you know, I'm sure we'll have Mohini back for future future webinars. So thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye now.